Thank you very much. And if any of you guys didn't make it to the early bird tours this morning, it was pretty phenomenal. So definitely set your alarms tomorrow and try and make a point of that because pretty good opportunity. We were the only ones up there. And well, yeah, it's up there for sure. So I'd like to introduce a good friend of mine and a pretty amazing speaker and individual. This is uh, Jeff Evans. He's got uh, quite a story to share with us today, and it's one that I think you'll all find to be incredibly interesting. When we came back from Ryan today, he was on a conference call with some of his partners, and one of the guys was talking about an upcoming trip up Everest on a route that nobody's ever done before, and the main focus of the conference call was about them bringing uh, 12 wounded warriors on an expedition in Ecuador, I believe, to some peaks that haven't been climbed down there. They're taking... Um, wounded veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq around, and it is part of that. Jeff has had the opportunity to tell his story to groups around the world, and a lot of the message is about communication. Jeff works with a very good friend of his who's blind, and he's had the opportunity to take him up Everest. So imagine the communication challenges that you guys face at your offices to share an idea with your team. Think about communicating that at 27,000 feet to somebody who can't see where they are. So it ties in great with our theme this year of leading the charge and leading the change. And Jeff will uh, be sharing his story with us. All right. Oh, no, don't steal my fire yet. <laughs> Golly. It was going forward. Now a moment, a word from our sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. All right. Let's get this thing locked in. So um, I'm going to talk while I figure this out. And I just read today that you don't learn to multitask until you're 17 years old, and that explains why I was just learned to drive a car um, not long ago. So, um, so what I hope to do today, as I figure this out, is. You know, I'm listening to, to Dr. Pete, and I'm listening to Steve, and I'm realizing what I want to do is actually cross-pollinate, in a way, what has been said already today. Uh, because a lot of my message is, is really, there's a lot of synergy between what I've heard uh, today and my experiences um, over the past 20 years in the mountains. And... <clears throat> I want to uh, I, I want to make this thing work is what I want to do. Um, and it's not. So who's the Mac specialist here? Let's see if you can, there's like 99% of you have a Mac in front of you right now. Yeah, it's not going. It's not going. See how it's not clicking. So. Um, you want to shot? You want to fire? You see what you do. So you know when I hear, when I listen today, uh, this morning, is Steve still here? So I listened to Steve and what he was saying, and you know, it, he he talked about vision. He talked about perseverance. He's talked about not only just creating a, a brand, but you know, taking that brand uh, and and holding on to it, reinventing himself every few years. And I just, I I really get that. And then I listened to uh, to Dr. Peter there and. You know, he t talks about, you know, pray for snow, but then prepare. And pr to prepare and pray have to be a part of it as well. And you're going to hear me reference that a little bit. And then, of course, just now, listening to the panel, it was all about managing expectations and being flexible. Um, I just learned a lot just now. Uh, there was a lot of, I think, really powerful things to say. Um, the idea of adjusting to your market and what the market gives you. Those are all things that as I talk to you here for the next little bit, I want you to, 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 to understand that even though I'm talking about climbing mountains and being with my bros up in the mountains and, and, and you know, finding, I got this one, I'm good. Okay. Um, that it's not, a, it's not about climbing those mountains. That's not the point of my stories today. It's not about ascending and descending, which we like to do, all of us in this room. We like to ascend and descend but that it's, it's more than that. It's what goes into those relationships and that time to be able that we have to come together as an industry 
and to be able to move forward. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, the one thing that, that, that Mike mentioned, you know, Mike and I have known each other for a while. I'm, I'm, I've known his wife, actually, for longer. And I, the first time I met Mike, um, well, it wasn't the first time I met you, but the first time we really hung out, I had a party at my house. And, uh, and we drank a little whiskey, I think, that night, specifically me and this guy. And uh, I have tennis courts that are private. I don't play tennis, but they're on the other side of the, of the fence from me. And uh, Mike leaned over to me, and he's like, what's on the other side of the fence? And, you know, this is like 1 o'clock in the morning. What's on the other side of the fence? And I said, well, it's, it's, uh, it's some, some, uh, some tennis courts. And he says, well, do you play tennis? And I said, well, not really. He said, do you have tennis rackets? And I said, well, strangely enough, I do. And he's like, let's go play. I said, well, they're locked, man. You can't get in them, you know. And so he's like, they're locked, but I think you can get in them. And so it became very clear to me that, okay, I'm just going to follow this guy and see what happens. We got a couple tennis rackets and a ball and headed out into there. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the Mission Impossible music comes on. Mike pulls his credit card out of his wallet and opens and busts into the tennis court and opens it up. And then we play nighttime Jack Daniels tennis for hours. And now a word from our sponsor. Yeah, that's... <laughs> And, you know, you all think that he's like some super rad snowboarder and he's really fast, which, by the way, this morning, um, you know, I went up with all, a lot of y'all on the first chair, and I am the guy who's on the skis, you know, and, and I, I stand up in the top, and the guy's like, let's charge down this one. And so we all stand up there, and I'm like standing beside Mike, and, you know, I start going down, and about 30 seconds later, it's just gone. Everybody's out, man. I didn't see him for the rest of the day. That was it. <laughs> No friends on a powder day, man. I get it. I understand what it's like. So, but just of all, you think that Mike's like some fast. He definitely, he shops for pumpkins on a scooter. So, just so you're aware that it's not all about speed. Your wife sent me that, though. That was not my fault. Yeah. Yeah. The cool thing, though, you know, when, when Mike told me about this group and, and who you were and some of your roles and responsibilities and, and the challenges and expectations and everything that's been sort of around in your industry in the past few years, um, I was excited, you know, I know that this is, this, is, this is a group of people who we've chosen to create our careers and our, our professions on our lifestyle, really. We like this lifestyle. It affords us to do things that we enjoy doing immensely. And I also was quite comfortable with the fact that y'all wake up with bad hair days just like me as much as I do, you know, and you almost guaranteed that. So as I've traveled all over the world for the past 20 years. I've, I've been doing this uh, climbing thing for a couple decades now. Um, I, I've, I've realized that a certain uh, style of person keeps coming back to me. And it keeps reminding me of sort of in a way who I try to be as a guide, as a mountain guide. Whatever clients I have, wherever I'm doing, whether it's my blind buddy or it's somebody I just met, um, I, I went to school at University of Colorado uh, and studied cultural anthropology and religious studies. And I was really into anthropology. It wouldn't get you a job anywhere, but it's awesome subject matter, really fascinating stuff. And there was this one guy who really resonated with me. I read everything. It's Joseph Campbell. And some of y'all probably know about Joseph Campbell. He's a fascinating academic. He talks about the thousand faces of myth, right, and how every legend throughout time, every myth throughout time, all really roots back to this idea of being a hero, right? That idea of the hero's journey and how ultimately we are all heroes. Each one of us is a hero. And not in the, you know, the defined textbook sense hero, like a fucking fireman going up and pulling a cat out of a tree, but more of a hero in that we hear that knock on the door, we choose to answer it or choose to not answer it in a lot of cases, and if we do, we go in, we battle, and we fight, and sometimes we get our asses handed to us. Sometimes we win, and then we move on, and then it's our choice to decide whether we want to share whatever it was that we learned in that battle. That's Campbell's theory of the hero's journey. And one group of people that really have exhibited to me that sort of hero's journey and the beautiful role of a hero are the Sherpas. Now, some of y'all have probably been to, uh, been to 
uh, Nepal in the past, and you have a deep appreciation, as I do, for the Sherpa population. These guys, specifically, these guys on this slide right here, uh, I've had some of the best and worst moments in my life with. Um, they have given me strength when I'm tired. They have carried my weight when I was exhausted and whooped. Uh, they have saved my life. They have been there for me in every sense. And so that would make you think like they're, they're, the, they're my hero, really. But it's more than that. These guys understand what it means, I think, to be loyal and committed to the people around them. And more importantly, they realize that it's not about them. It's not about each of these people as an individual, that it's about all of us collectively together. And that they're not going to win if we don't all collectively win. It isn't that the case with this room right now. We're hearing about you know, a lot of really rough things that are going on within the industry. And whether it's the, bad, whether it's the recession or the, you know, the product fluctuation or the, the consumer index or the bad weather, the no snow, whatever it is, it's a matter of hooking arms. And that's what I've learned from these guys. And not only are they like that, but to me, I, I've, I've seen them you know, emotionally and spiritually just show such strength. But also, as you, can under, as you might anticipate, they're strong like you read about. I mean, straight up strong, killer strong beasts, man. Tiny little fellas, you know, and they just crush all of us. Over and over again, I can tell you, this has happened to me dozens of times. I've been in the Himalayas, I've done 11 Himalayan expeditions, and I've been going up some, you know, face, and I'm, you know, thinking I'm tough, and I'm strong, and I'm climbing hard, and my buddy Appa over here, you know, who weighs about 105 pounds, he's carrying a pack just about as much as he weighs, he's cruises by, and he, I'm, you know, panting and huffing and puffing, and Appa comes by, and he's like, hello, Mr. Jeff, and then flies by me, you know, and about two hours later, I get up to a rock, you know, and this has happened so many times. I get up to this rock, and there's Appa sitting there, and I'm like, Appa, man, that was awesome, dude. You're so strong. You move so fast. And he's like, oh, Mr. Jeff, you're very good, too. You're very, very strong. There's like a big pile of reds all in front of him, you know. It's like, dude, man. So strong, tough guy. So here it is. Hold on. Here it is in picture form, okay? Here it is in picture form. Here I am. I think on this, this is where we were on... Uh, the Shishipangma, and I'm climbing Everest, or wherever I'm climbing, I've got this uh, bedroll and oxygen bottle and oxygen system and nice expensive down suit and this and that and all this stuff, best money you can buy. And then you look over here at, at, at uh, Tenzing. Tenzing's got on like Oakley blades like my dad used to wear. I don't even know. He's got on a down jacket, but it, it's got duct tape all over it and feathers flying out all over the place. He's got a steel frame pack on, first of all, which y'all will appreciate. No one else really appreciates that. He's carrying an oxygen bottle, but he's not even breathing it. He's carrying it for me. <laughs> and the best part, of course, is he has on blue jeans. <laughs> and they're not even Levi's. They're like Jordash or something. <laughs> you know what you realize real quick? Rock star, sissy. <laughs> I ain't afraid to admit it. So a few years ago, uh, there was this study that was done um, to try and determine uh, why it is that Tenzing and Appa and the whole Sherpa population handles it to the Western population. There's got to be some reason, right? There's got to be some physiologic reason. Maybe they, you know, they perfuse oxygen more efficiently, maybe just because they live at you know, 13,000 feet. Maybe something. There's more hemoglobin. Everybody's speculating. Maybe they got gills or something. I don't know. But for some reason, that dude kicks that guy's ass every single time in the mountains. And there's got to be a reason. So a bunch of smart people all came together, Brown University people and NASA, and, and they spent a lot of money on this study. And we were part of the, the control group for the Westerners. And so um, they did all this different data and compared these variables, right? They took the, the Sherpas and the Westerners, and they said, you know, active heart rate, uh, resting heart rate, hemoglobin concentration, pulse oximetry, blah, blah, all the way down. It was like 12, 15 points of data. Compare them back and forth. And at the end, because we were in the study, I got the study results, right? And I remember the day I got it. I went out and got it in the mail, and I, I brought it in, and I looked at it, and it was like, you know, 30, 40 pages long, and it was all this bullshit. And as I got all the way through, I did what I did in medical school. I went all the way through to the end and read the conclusion. That's what we do, right? In conclusion, and it says, in conclusion, 
there was no disparity or discrepancy between the Sherpa population and the Western population. And it went on to say a few more things. And then at the end, in conclusion, and therefore, our study is inconclusive. <laughs> Not kidding you. That's what it said. $200,000 later, that's what they came up with. And I laughed. I was like, really, man? Because what you're telling me is actually the most conclusive thing you can, right? Because you're telling me that dude's going to the same, to the playing field with the same gear I got. Except I know that he hammers down twice as hard as I do every single day and always gets into camp first, always is carrying a bigger load, always gets camp set up first, always starts melting snow first, always. So what is it? Why is that? So I figured it out after my trips over there. To me, all it comes down to is straight up the six inches between homies' ears. That's it. It's attitude. It's all about attitude for them. They understand that they've got a job to do, and it's not going to be, it's not too hard, it's not too long, it's not too heavy. It's just, it's, that's my job, and I'm going to nail it and get it done. Because if I don't, other people will suffer and not be able to succeed and stand on top. That's how they get it done. So, you know, I always, I've always i got a little six-year-old, and I'm always, like, trying to think of cool things to say to him. And so, you know, I've recently started saying, you know, I'm updating the Nike campaign, Be Like Mike. I'm updating it. I'm like, dude, be like a Sherpa. Be like a Sherpa. And he's like, what? You know, he does. But I explained, all it means to me is just ponying up, getting your job done every single day. Not wasting time thinking about what it could be like, what it might be like, what it could be like in the past. I love the fact that we like, you know, the rear view mirror comment was awesome. I've, I also read a book that I really love called The Power of Now, and I have a feeling some of y'all have probably read that too, Eckhart Tolle. It's all about being in this moment because that's all you've got. Now, that forecasting model has to be there for a lot of you. You have to think back on trends previous, but this moment right now is what you've got. So, rock star, sissy. So, you know, thinking about that whole hero's journey thing and the idea of being a hero and everything that you do, it's really, to me, it comes down, it, it, it goes beyond sitting in this room. It goes beyond your work life. It goes beyond your professional existence. It's really more importantly, as I think someone mentioned earlier, it's the, it's, it's the group of people that you're with every day, your family, your friends, your, your community, the people that you're spending time with. That's the person who you're a hero to every day, and whether you want to upstand and really embody that idea of being a hero. And so, you know, George Lucas freely admitted that, Luce, that uh, Star Wars was completely framed on Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, being that hero. So the first process always with that is when the knock on the door happens. And the question that I have to answer is, whether I'm going to respond to that knock and really think about whether it's the right thing to do. And sometimes, you know, maybe it's wise to not answer. But according to what's going on and the, the things that are happening with you professionally and personally. But more times than not, it's time to answer that call and walk through that door. And when I think back on, like, all the, the knocks that I've had over the years, the most, one of the, the most random ones and probably one of the most powerful ones that have ever happened in my life is when I heard from this guy who was blind. <clears throat> he was knocking on my door, and, uh, so to speak. Although at the time when he called, I was living what I thought was a pretty successful existence. I was, <clears throat> well, I was, I was living in my van down by the river. I mean, I, was, I literally was living in Joshua Tree, California in my van. And I was rock climbing every single day, and I loved it. It was all I was doing. I was eating ramen noodles and pizza crust, and that was it. I was climbing every day, and I was excited. And so this blind guy, Eric, had decided that he didn't want to just sort of be complacent and just watch it all go by, no pun intended, right, and just kind of sit down and, and allow, you know, life to happen around him. He wanted to be active, and he found that rock climbing was this thing that really inspired him. The problem was when you're rock climbing, when you're blind, you need other people with you. You need a rope team. You need people to trust you. And no one was really willing to hang it out there with a blind guy. Everybody was holding back. So he went through this whole list of guides. And then he got off the, the list and then got onto like a sticky note or something and got me. Like, maybe you should call this dude. 
And so he came to me, and I finally, you know, I, I, I was like, all right, I'll meet him. You know, why don't you come out to J-Tree and, and meet me, and we'll go climbing for a weekend and see, if, you know, how we get along and, you know, see what happens and answer in that knock. And so he comes out, and the first thing I notice about dude is that as well as being blind, he's also by default he's colorblind as well. <laughs> His daughter, his daughter used to say he looked like a bag of Skittles when he was getting up in the morning. He's a straight up mess. But he, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a good dresser either. But I was like, dude, I'm not going in the mountains with you looking like that for sure. But then, you know, the more, impo more importantly, the first day of climbing, I've, this very powerful event started to happen as the day unfolded. You know, I'd start on an easy route. I didn't know what this guy could do. Uh, he, you know, he. He, easy route and then progressively harder and harder as the day went on and then finally we were doing some really hard routes and so the sun goes down you know it's dark outside I get up to what I think is a route there's no way he's gonna be able to do this and I struggle through it and get up I'm sitting there and he fires it he gets up and he sits next to me man and I'm like whoa dude you just crushed it I'm so so fired up so happy you know like you're really really solid climber now the sun's gone down, let's go hit it, man. Let's go down and drink a beer and eat some ramen noodles or something, you know? And No kidding, you blind dude looks me square in the eyes. He goes, you think I care if the sun's gone down? Let's go. And he was not kidding. I mean, straight, straight up, he's like, put your headlamp on and let's get going, if you're up to it. And I was like, I did one of those, <laughs> really? Are you serious? And he goes, yeah, let's go, man. I only got two days here. Let's fire it. Let's go. So I put my headlamp on. We climbed until 3 o'clock in the morning, pitch black. Dude wanted to go. He just had to find somebody that believed in him and that was willing to rope up with him and go out there. Well, that was 20 years ago. And so if we fast forward a little bit, you know, I mean, all through those 20-year period, you'll hear about a couple of these climbs, but, you know, we climbed a lot of stuff, and we failed at way more stuff than we succeeded at. We came up way short, way many more times than we stood on top. But every time, we sort of learned how to do it more efficiently and more effectively and communicate closely again and again. And how every time that we busted our rears, we stood back up and brushed ourselves off and said, okay, we screwed up a little bit. Let's figure out how we can do that better. Or perhaps it was just bad route selection. Or perhaps it was just a really bad weather window that we had. You know, we made our plans to go climb that particular time. The weather wasn't good, and we got our butts handed to us. Does that story sound familiar to you? So we, that happens, it, and it happens. And so we would pull back, we'd recalibrate, re-strategize, and then execute and get out again. Now, if you come back about a year ago, one of the strangest, I think, calls to adventure, calls to action that Eric and I ever together had as a team came when we got a call from this dude uh, named Mark Burnett. And some of y'all have watched some of his crappy television, I think, in the past. Probably he's made stupid shows like Survivor and things of that sort. Um, other, I'm a Survivor hater. Um, but I find, I, I don't know, I find that stuff very much annoying. And that's why I found it terribly annoying that Mike Lewis put that I was a TV personality on my bio. <laughs> Thanks, dude. So I disdain all that stuff, right? I think it's all annoying. However, when Burnett called us, and he's like, you know, I've been following you guys, and, and uh, I've got this new show. He was Australia. I've got this new show, you know, and, and uh, it's called Expedition Impossible. And, it's, and, I, uh, and I was like, well, all right, what, so what is it? And he goes, well, we're going to try and bring back Eco Challenge, basically. You know, adventure racing, like at a pretty high level, pretty hardy stuff. And Eric and I had done some pretty tough uh, adventure races, expedition length adventure races, days and days. One, one, one that we did, we took us nine days to finish and we slept 18 hours in those nine days and it completely sucked and I guarantee you, other than the fact that I have a little kid now, that's why I went gray. It was because of that race. We just got crushed, slept 18 hours, just ruined every single day. It was hard, but I loved it. It was awesome. I was just, I, I, loved, I loved suffering, you know, I enjoy it immensely. And uh, my mom's convinced she dropped me on my head. That, so when we started thinking about this, and the, he threw out the idea of eco-challenge, and this was like a call back to eco-challenge. It's like, all right, so are there people voted off or anything like that? And he goes, no, no, no. First team across wins, multiple stages, all these different disciplines, climbing, rappelling, horseback riding, cerebral pu puzzles and riddles and things of that sort, paddling, 
mountain climbing, like, sounds pretty cool, right? It's all the stuff we all do. We enjoy that kind of stuff. Well, all right, so it sounds good. So we answered the call. We walked through the door. We headed to Morocco. Teams of three, 13 teams of three. We arrive in Morocco. No one's allowed to talk to anybody while we're walking around this hotel for three days. None of the teams are. Everybody's kind of sequestered, right? So you got these 13 teams of three all kind of walking around the hotel, the grounds, and everybody's just kind of looking, and they're do everybody's doing what everybody does, you know? It's like, what's up? And everybody's kind of doing a little bit of that, you know? And, you know, you're kind of arching. Everybody's sticking it out a little bit and watching with some NFL football players. And, of course, they don't have to do that. And, and of course, you know, here's I, here I am walking around with Eric, and, you know, here's Eric, like, bumbling over curbs and stuff. And people are seeing that, and they're like, blind dude over there? Is that a blind dude or is he drunk? You know, what's going on with him? He realized the blind guy. I was like, okay, so it was all a matter of perception. So we learned later, this is what one of the teams said. When we first realized that there was a guy in the competition who was blind, I felt like, awesome, one, one down. I'm glad I didn't know that before. Uh, but, you know, I don't blame her. I don't blame her for saying that because I mean, it is perception, right? I mean, they saw this blind dude bumbling around and, and uh, you know, they figured they could knock him out. By the way, she was on the second team to get knocked out of the competition. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the idea of perceiving things for us was not a problem. And it, we later heard a couple of the teams started saying, you know, after a while, one of the teams realized, like, started whispering around, I think that's the blind guy that climbed Everest. <laughs> suddenly, you know, they're like, oh, shit. Oh, wow. Well. Huh, okay. Well, so anyway, the race goes on, 10 stages. When people saw the show, they always, they, they talk to me about it. They come back to this one moment that happened about halfway through. And I'm going to show it, you the clip. And I want you to realize that 20 years went into this one 90 second clip. <clears throat> All right, it's going to be about a, uh, oh my God, it's like a 30 footer. What? Yeah, that's cool. It's cool. 30 footer. It's no problem, though, dude. It's no problem. You will do this. Eric's been trusting me for close to 20 years now, you know. He's just been listening to what I'm saying. If I say, jump off this cliff, he knows I'm going to lead him in the right way. I've got his best interest in mind. Chances are good that he's going to live through it. He's just got to trust me and jump at the same oh. time. Over here. Over here. Stand right next to me. Left? Yes. Left in? Yes. Don't knock me off. Okay. I'm right on the edge. No, no, no. On this side. On your right. Yeah, right there. OK, we're good. That's the edge. That's the edge. Okay. You got it? Stand up. No, no, no. You got to stand up. What? You got to stand up and jump. You can't sit down. Hold on to me. Just give me your hand. Give me your hand. Ready? Cut. One, two, three. Oh. Oh. So that's 20 years. And I think Weinmayer would be the first person to uh, point out how good a form he has going into the water. <laughs> and what a douche the guy next to him is with his leg all propped up. But, um, you know, that kind of process that just happened right there instant, instantly at that, at that rock, you know, it, it doesn't come for free. He knows I'm going to tell him the right thing, albeit it was about a 50-foot jump, and I told him it was 30, and you can tell a blind dude that, right? <laughs> Halfway through, he's like, this is longer than you said, man. <laughs> but you know, it, it, this, this thing that happened up there was just very organic, and it was pure, and it, and it, and it, uh, it happened beautifully, and, and uh, it was an, an investment of energy and time and trust that went into that. So as the race progressed, um, the thing that I've, I've heard about today that was really interesting in being here this afternoon is this whole idea of, of dealing with adversity, right? And dealing with, you know, a certain set of variables and issues in a landscape that's out in front of you. And when you just think you've got it figured out, right? I feel like I've got, okay, I've got this issue here. I've got a blind dude with me. You know what? That's probably going to slow me down a little bit. We're not going to be able to charge quite as hard as two or three of the other teams. But maybe we use our adver adversity as fuel, maybe our experience of 20 years of being in, in the mountains, we can actually have some more experience and make better decisions than a lot of these little 
you know, these urban teens, you know, that really don't understand what it means to suffer in the mountains. So, you know, we've got that going for us. So now I just feel like I've got it figured out. Okay, I know this is this and this is this. Um, about three quarters of the way through the stage seven, my third teammate has an incident, and I want to show it to you. Hey. Okay, okay, let's go. Let's go, let's go. I'll hop in the back seat this time. Go, Air Force! On the way back, just, uh, you know, in spite of climbing mountains, running through rivers, I fell and snapped my ankle. Once again, we did okay. Malik, we need to get the best way there, though, okay? No getting lost this time. Uh, what's wrong? Oh, man. Took a digger at the door. That same ankle that I broke. Push, push, push this way into his hand. Yeah. Push. They want to know if it's painful. Yeah. This is a reoccurring injury. I originally uh, injured it in Afghanistan, so my gut's telling me I may have rebroken it. So I, he can't exclude a fracture either. He wants to do an X-ray. I'm obviously concerned about my boy Ike. I hope that he's okay. But if I'm in Vegas and I'm a bet man, he's got a fracture. So you know, and it's just when you think you got it all figured out, now Ike goes and rolls his ankle on a curb of all places, and he gets a pretty significant high ankle sprain. puts in a gets put in a cast, uh, and now we're truly hobbled, and we still got a bunch left to go. And I think that it's easy in certain cases, and I've done it enough times to, to raise my hand and say that, yes, I've done this, to just sort of tap out and say, you know what, geez, man, it was like, it sucked here, but now it, like, really sucks. You know, now it's like, whoa, I just, how can we ever deal, right? Well, there's one way to deal, and it's just to make fun of the situation. Yeah, you got walking down, but you still see better than me. You still walk better than him. Yeah. Together, the two of you, I could put together a whole man. I mean, <laughs> I could take parts of each one of you and make one dude. We, we uh, you know, we realize, like, if we just kind of dwell on this thing, that it's just going to screw us up, you know, and all we can do is do what we do, and that's just knuckle down, work together as a team, try to communicate effectively, but nurture each other and lift each other up because this could be hard. But you know what? What's the alternative? Just completely rolling over and letting it all pass over us and letting a bunch of, you know, sissies from Los Angeles, be, oh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, uh, a bunch of, of non-outdoorsy uh, folks, uh, beat it. No, like we weren't going to let that happen. We were going to try and charge and stay together and communicate at a very high level. So, you know, in the mountains, it, it, always, it always is a, a reoccurring issue for us, the ability to be able to adapt and not even just the ability to be able to, it, just anticipating that change. And that's really what I've heard today. Really, for me, that's the take home, is anticipating change, being ready for it, being able to roll with it. Because it is going to happen, right? So this shot right here was taken uh, while we were on Lhotse. And it was taken about 30 seconds before this shot. And y'all have been there. You know what it's like. You've been out there where it's like bluebird, and then bam, it's right on top of you. But when it's at 8,000 meters, it gets real, real fast. Because if you're not ready for that, you get rolled. You just get fully steamrolled, and then you get dead. So the thing that I always have to remind myself is that, you know, when I'm with Eric, even though it goes from this to this, and my visibility drops quite a bit, that that's what my buddy sees right there, right? And so, yeah, that's pretty bad right there, but it sure beats that. And I have to remind myself that that's just the case, man. You know, I mean, I need to be that expert. You're all leaders. You're in this room for a reason. You're all leaders in your industry, and you're that person. You're that sentinel. You're that expert. It's there to provide guidance and be that shoulder because ultimately people will be relying on you when that storm rolls in and punches you square in the face like perhaps it has this year. So another group of heroes to me, and once again, not in the conventional sense that I think all of you know, America tries to do this whole like Whoa, with the men and women in our military. But for me, it's the heroes in the definition of the hero's journey, right? That idea of these guys and gals that, that go into the, the armed services for whatever reason, choose to do that, volunteer basis. 
They go in, they answer that call, and they go in, and they go into combat in some form or another. And as Mike alluded to, I've, I've uh, recently, in the past two years, realized that I had a debt of gratitude that I had to pay back uh, to them um, and kind of say thank you for providing me kind of the, the life that I've, that I've led, in a way, um, and, and I appreciate it. I don't agree with, you know, 1% of the politics and the BS that go behind it, but for them to make this commitment to, to, to doing what they do, I find is the true hero's journey. So in that sense of respect and deep gratitude, Eric and I came up with this idea to take a bunch of injured vets climbing. This is the only thing we really know how to do. So we took these guys, we, we identified a group of men and women who were really truly broken. I mean, straight up broken in a lot of ways, physically, emotionally, spiritually, just torn up from whatever reason. Guys uh, that, like Ike, you just saw right here, he was the team, he's our teammate on that show. Guy had been injured three times, he has two purple hearts. If you get more than one purple heart, turns out some people just say you're klutzy after a while, but he's a tough guy. Well, we all identified this one mountain over in Nepal. It was actually in the shadow of Everest, it's a 20,000 foot peak called Lobuche. And it's a real mountain, it's legit. Um, and we weren't dealing with climbers. We weren't even, in case, some cases, dealing with outdoorsy people. So we had to really train them. But we identified them as being people we felt could really embody that idea of being a hero and going out and challenging themselves and then coming back and sharing it in hopes of rehabilitating others. So we found guys like Matt Nyman. It's one of my favorite pictures ever. Two guys, three legs, walking down the trail in Nepal. Matt Nyman on the right there was a Delta Force operator. And for those of y'all that don't know what that is, that dude's a straight up killing machine. He is one of the most highly trained uh, soldiers that has ever existed on the planet. This dude is tough, man. So this guy was going in hot in a helicopter and was landing on a, uh, a roof in, in uh, Baghdad uh, about five or six years ago. And a, a piece of material, like a sleeping pad, went up into the bird's wings, up in the rotor. And it caused the, the bird to drop down and slam down on the, on the ceiling really hard, which threw Matt straight up into the rotor. And the rotor of the helicopter chopped his right leg off, slowed it down just enough to where it hit the left leg but didn't take it off but caused permanent nerve damage to that left leg. So now his good leg is actually his prosthetic leg. Women like Nico, who's an ordnance uh, bomb sniffer basically with dogs, and she'd go out into these buildings and clear them. And at one point, this bomb blew up, and this building collapsed on her, injured her significantly. She was at Walter Reed for a long time, and didn't walk for two and a half years. Was in a wheelchair, and it just was starting to sort of get her strength back. Guys like Dan, tough Marine, jarhead, leatherneck, you name it, this dude could kill any one of us with two fingers. I mean, straight up, legit dude, who after going through some of the battles that he went through in Fallujah and other places, shooting thousands of rounds from a 50 cal and inflicting a lot of, of injury and death, dude can't even leave his house in Phoenix, Arizona to go to the grocery store. He's a broken, completely broken man. Guys like Steve Vasquez. Steve is Young kid, first deployment in Iraq, driving a, a really souped up Humvee called an MRAP, driving down the road. Uh, a, a very sophisticated IED blows up, vaporizes the dude next to him, his best friend. A piece of hot shrapnel goes right through Steve's optic nerve, causing permanent blindness and limited use of his left upper extremity. These guys were beaten. And then another group all the way to 12. We had 12 of them that went up there. We trained them for a month leading up to it and then went over and did this climb. You know, I went over as the, you know, the, the expedition leader, as the guide, you know, thinking that I sort of knew my way around a little bit. And I realized <coughs> that I was actually the, the student here. I was the one who walked away learning the most. Uh, I've been on bigger mountains and harder mountains and steeper mountains, but I've never been as proud as I was um, that afternoon when I stood on top with these guys. I was the one who actually was the student. I was taught so much about loyalty and about commitment and about answering that call and about learning what it is about yourself and then coming back 
and sharing it. And finding your bliss. It's another thing that Campbell writes about. Finding your bliss. What is it that really makes you happy? What is it that drives you? What is it that pushes you and makes your heart full? That's what it comes down to. Now, for, for us, you know, of course, you know, we're, we're irreverent mountain climbers, just like y'all are irreverent, you know, you know snow industry folks, too. All, all of us are fairly irreverent. I've, I've been hanging out with Mike long enough to know that. So the thing that happened with us, you know, is there was lots of prosthetics lying around, you know, and, um, you know, those of us who don't have prosthetics don't really know what they're used for other than just for using them to get around. So, of course, we started using them for reasons that they probably shouldn't have been, like sponsorship shots and things of that sort. And then, of course, just like any climbing expedition does, um, it usually turns into a bit of a, a drunken debauchery at the end. And <laughs> Yeah. And that was at the end of the trip, and that thing had not been washed at all. <laughs> Chinese whiskey tastes bad to begin with, and then you start putting it in a prosthetic leg that you know hadn't been washed at all. It was just gnarly. And I'm really not sure who the redneck in the background is that showed your mom. But you know, the idea of of, of being uh, that hero to me was really was really emphasized and and really defined for me. I realized what it what it really meant um, to be that hero. And so you know. Eric and I, um, through that that twenty year period, we've 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 tried to answer the call, and as I mentioned, you know, sometimes it went well and sometimes it didn't. But as we went through our journey of what we later sort of realized we were doing was climbing the seven summits, the the highest point on each of the seven continents, and you know we went and knocked a bunch of them off, and we were climbing some others in between. Went to Yosemite and climbed a bunch of big walls there, and then um, turned our attention to the biggest mountain in Asia, the biggest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. And we, you know, we realize we may be biting off a little bit more than we can chew, you know. Some, some uh, experts on Mount Everest were coming out, you know, like our buddy John Krakauer was like, man, he had just come back two years, you know, late earlier and had that big into thin air story. And he's like, man, I mean, y'all have done some good things with Eric, but, you know, getting him up Everest is going to be a complete junk show. I can promise you that. And it's, it's going to be hard. And not only is he probably going to get whacked, he's probably going to get one of you smoked as well. And so we're hearing that kind of stuff. And we're like, whoa, you know. But what we realize is that, you know, even though John and a few other guys are good buddies and they were experts on Mount Everest, they weren't experts on us. And if we did what we went to go do and we communicated well and we stayed together as a team, that maybe we wouldn't summit, but we'd at least go up and have a shot. But one of the cornerstones of what we knew we had to do as a team was put together a group of guys who really, truly embraced the idea of something bigger than themselves. So we identified a group of folks that, that were really there, where they were selfless. It was a group of guys who understood what it means to shelf your own agenda, your own aspirations, and work for the betterment of the team. Because all of us know, each one of us know, this one really amazing thing when you're on a mountain. You're connected by a rope. You're always connected by a rope. You're going to win together. You're going to lose together. Whatever happens, it's going to happen together. So I'll paint a picture for you. You know, I'm being the guide for 20 years. I've been the, typically the, out in front of the, the rope. And if I've got a five or six person rope team, you know, I've got five, six people behind me. And this is a, this is a scenario that's happened multiple times where I'm, you know, climbing up, and it's a bluebird day, and it's feeling good, and everybody's cruising and feeling strong, and, and, and I'm, my legs are feeling strong. My lungs are filling up. It's a good day. And then all the way in the back, five, six people deep, this guy right here had a pretty lousy night. For whatever reason, he was up all night. He was exhausted. He was tired. He woke up, not feeling good, but obligation to team, put on the boots, put on the pack, and he's cruising along, and sooner or later, you know what happens, right? Boom! Catches his foot, falls down, and now each one of us, one by one, doo, 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 until I'm whistling along up here, and then boom! I'm just ripped right out from under me. And now I'm falling down. And now you might be thinking, you know, like, why, why on earth would you put the rope on you? Those of you who don't do a lot of mountaineering, well, my dad came to me a few years ago, and my, I'm from the south, and my dad's just a good southern man, and he doesn't understand, none of my family understands this whole climbing thing. They, you know how in the South you, you do a lot of, if you're, if you're doing something people are a little bit, you know, disappointed with, you get a lot of 
bless your heart, you know. I got a lot of bless your hearts when I was growing. Bless his heart. Poor thing out there, you know. So uh, that was kind of, you know, my, my dad doesn't get it. So he came to me and he said, you know, man, I think I figured out why is it that y'all put that rope on you. He said, I think, I, I think it's to keep the smart ones from turning around and going home. Dad was probably on some, but I, I, I explained to him the reason is because just as many times as it happens that I'm, you know, in the front, it has happened to me countless times. Matter of fact, on Everest, in the Himalaya, where I'm the dude in the back, I'm wasted, tired, I get up, I put my boots on, I fall off, and I'm like, oh, shit, I'm pulled, oh, and I start to fall, and now I'm pulling every one of my teammates off. Now it makes sense. Now I'm pretty happy that I've got a good rope team on. And you know what? I don't want to be worrying about who I put on my rope team at that point. I don't want to be second guessing. I sure hope they can stop this thing. I want to know right there, they're going to stop this. They're going to stop this fall. I know they are. And you know what's even cooler is when, I ha when that has happened to me, and I've been the one that's responsible for pulling everybody off their feet, never has it happened where my teammates have stood up and said, what's going on? Who screwed up? It's just, are you guys all right? Everybody's cool? All right. We're good to go? Let's pony up and keep going. Every time that's happened. And that's a beautiful thing when that happens because you're shocked. You're like, whoa, man. Whoo, that was heavy. Okay, everybody's cool. All right, we're moving on. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of that collective power of one. So, you know, as Mike and I were talking about this, you know, we've got this, this room of people who, you know, in some cases they're direct competitors. The wonderful thing about it is you're in this industry together, and it's all about being on that rope team for this moment. Going forward, it's about locking arms and moving forward and understanding in those salad years and those lean years, it's about coming together and advancing because we're here together right now. Walking out that door, we're still together even more so. So, you know, once Eric and I put together this team and we headed out, we, uh, we're blessed enough to have a group of trekkers come with us. And the reason I say we were really fortunate to have them, uh, they were a great distraction for us. There's about 25 of them. They were going to be walking up to base camp with us. It's a, quite a trek. It's 10 days, get up to 17,000 feet. A bunch of really cool folks were with us. And, uh, and, and one guy in particular, uh, his name was Tom. And Tom was about 75 years old at the time, and he was... He had a rough go. I mean, it was hard work for him to get up there. And he, he got up to base camp, and we all were sitting there, and we're talking. And, and, uh, and I, I noticed uh, as we're talking, Tom's got this nosebleed. And I'm like, Tom, you got you know, a little something right there, man. You know, get that. And it starts really bleeding, like full-on gushing blood. Well, I'm a physician assistant, very part-time, but I'm a PA. I work in the emergency department in Denver. Um, in very infrequently, but I put out a lot of nosebleeds, hundreds of nosebleeds in the emergency room. And in this case, you know, I didn't have a lot to work with. When I'm in the ER, I got, you know, light source and speculum and cautery and all this kind of stuff. Well, 17,000 feet Everest Base Camp, I didn't have a lot to work with. So I had to be resourceful, you know, a man's got to be resourceful. So well, we'll refer to them as feminine hygiene products. I went through 13 feminine hygiene products in Tom's nose over the course of this one whole night. Was up with him all night. Just kept dipping them in this stuff called epinephrine and shoving them up in his nose, trying to get everything to be blocked off. Couldn't get it stopped. 13 of these things. Had to give him bilateral IVs. Tom was just bleeding out significantly. So the next morning, we woke up and I said, I can't get this thing stopped. So I had to call on Tom a $2,000 helicopter ride to come pick him up and take him back. And then he affectionately became known as Tampon Tom. <laughs> Still, just in here alone on Mount Everest, because there's so many moving parts. It's like an organism just moves. It moves in an average of three feet a day, opening and shifting and closing and exploding. So it's just immense place, just so hugely immense. It opens up into these big, huge ice crevasses, right? And y'all know what crevasses are. Just some of them as wide as this room, 60, 70 foot wide. And then they, it turns into these huge seracs, some of them 40 or 50 stories high, and they all shift and move. And this place is just, Eric kept saying, he's like, man, you guys, this, 
this place just does not suit the Americans with Disabilities Act at all, you know. It's just this big old jumbled up mess. And how do you get across some of these crevasses? You use the ladders. And y'all have all seen pictures of the ladders here. Well, some of those crevasses are so deep that the Sherpas say if you fall in them, you end up back in America. <laughs> Bottomless things. And then, you know, you get to hold on to this little tiny polypropylene rope, you know, and I wouldn't even tie my dog to a fence with that stuff. It's like Kmart Sherpa boat twine or something. I don't even know what it was, but it's all strapped all over the place. And, you know, it was the first time through there, it took me 15 hours to get Eric through there. 15 hours of the hardest guiding I've ever done in my life. Super, super intense. Very, very precise uh, comments, guiding, suggestions, details. Just what he needed, but not too much. So, you know... Obviously, the 60-footers, you know, you walk across those ladders and you just kind of balance across. But how did I get Eric across the shorter ones, like the six-foot sections? Well, I told him to jump. Straight up, told him to jump. So I'd hold the rope, like over here, and I'd just hold it, and I'd give him a little bit of guidance as to where it was. He'd use his little antennas, and he'd reach over where it was. And I'd say, all right, two steps back. And when I say go, you hit it. And you run, and you take those two steps, and you launch. And don't come up short. Stick the landing, dude. Stick it. And he did every single time. Over and over and over again, he did it. And now, think about that cliff jump, right? That's where it comes from, is moments like this. Years of doing this over and over, of communicating effectively, telling the people around you exactly what they need to know, not, not being verbose, not over the top, not flooding them with information, but allowing them to pick and choose those things that you've got coming out, right? Just to be able to be very precise, this is exactly what you need. Boom, going forward. So first time took us 15 hours getting through that ice fall. We went through it 10 times, up and down, up and down, up and down, acclimatizing. Each time, your body's producing more hemoglobin. You're going up, you're breathing a little bit better, a little bit better each time. Every time it still kind of sucks, but you're up and you're scared, but you're making it, and now all of a sudden, you know, a month and some change later, you get up to the South Call, and now you're 8,000 meters, 26,000 feet, and now things stop working. <laughs> Your body's crapping out on you, you know, you, you, there's no oxygen at all in the air, you know, the oxygen molecules are very much spread apart. Your body's very hypoxic, you need oxygen, your brain is swelling up, your lungs are filling up with fluid, you're drowning basically, you lose your appetite, you can't assimilate nutrition, you eat something, you can't get anything out of it, you lose your thirst mechanism, and you can't sleep. An awesome place to spend a summer vacation, really cool. So, I mean, you're really, you're dying, essentially. You can't sustain life at that altitude, so you're up there, and you know, and, and, and uh, it, the idea was as we rolled in to the camp, this camp up there, we were going to lay down and rest for a few hours. And then the alarms were going to go off at 8 p.m. And then we are going to head out the tent door at 9 p.m. And we are going to climb all night long in hopes of summiting the next morning at whatever, 10, 11, maybe noon, and then come back. It's going to be a 24-hour day. Okay, that's cool. That's what's going to happen. 8 p.m., wake up, 9 p.m., go out. So it's about 1.30 or so, and I'm going to lay down about 2 and start resting. And as I'm getting ready to sort of rack out and lay down um, and think about all the ways I'm about to die that night, I feel like I'm hungry. And so I'm it's not really supposed to be happening. I had already, I'd already lost 45 pounds. I mean, really, it just, just tons of weight was dropping off all of us. We'd been going for two months. We were beat. We were tired. You know, we were just, just over it. It had been a long trip. We were ready to, <laughs> ready to just be done with it, you know, and go eat pizza and drink beer. I mean, we were still committed. This was it. This was the last chance we had. It was the end of May. Permit was about to run out. Oxygen was almost depleted, food's gone, gas is gone, all the ladders down in the ice fall were about to get pulled, this is all we had. So here we are, sit down, now I'm feeling hungry. Well, the only thing you got to eat up there are these MREs. Some of y'all probably know what an MRE is, it's a bag of nasty food. And 
Spaghetti and meatballs is pretty much all you got. So you put it in a, a big uh, pot of hot water and get it all hot and eat it. And so I ate one of those. It was really good. So I ate one of those, and now I was thirsty. I'm pretty thirsty. That's pretty weird. Okay, so I went on and drank a whole liter of water. Drank the whole liter of water. Now I'm feeling fat and full. It's 2 o'clock. I might even lay down and just kind of rest for a little bit. Wow, that's okay. So I laid down, and the, the wind was still just nuking outside, blowing probably 50 mile an hour. Just felt like any minute the, the, uh, the tent was just going to blow into Tibet. I mean, just pick us up and go. Wind's blowing, laid down. And I looked at my watch. It was 2 p.m. All right, 8 p.m. I'm going to try and get up. Okay, so it's light outside. So I put my earplugs in, oxygen mask on my face, bandana over my, over my eyes. And I laid down. The next thing I know, I opened my eyes up. And the first thing I noticed was the wind still just blasting outside, just as hard, if not harder. But then I noticed it was dark. And I peeled my jackets back and I looked, and it was 750 something, 753, 754. Alarms were about to go off. And I just slept for six hours. And I sat up, I turned my headlamp on, and the alarms hadn't gone off yet, but I very clearly remember the other four guys in the tent sitting up at the same time. And no one said anything. Nothing was spoken, which was really weird for this group of guys, as you guys, a lot of y'all can imagine. We're always just giving each other shit, you know? So silence. The only thing was I remember... As my headlamp passed across the face of you know, each one of my buddies, there was, a, there was a smirk out of the corner of the oxygen mask and a nod like, here we go, man, and a little Super Bowl Sunday. This is it. This is, this is everything we've ever thought of and trained for was this night right here. And so I packed up everything. As I was packing everything up, I had about an hour to get my two packs of goo and a half a liter of water packed, you know, and... It's about all I'm going to eat for 24 hours and make sure my oxygen bottles are right, my extra gloves and all this, just make sure it's all ready to go. And as I'm packing up, I notice this sensation in my chest, this thing in my chest. And I ignored it at first. I didn't think anything about it, but then uh, it became pretty, pretty profound. And so I, I, I pulled the layers back and I kind of pushed on my chest. I wasn't sure really what it, what it was. I had never felt it before, but it was this sensation. Now, I had just gotten done with medical school, so of course when you're in medical school and you read all these pathophysiology books about all these different things, bad things that can happen to the human body, you know, you're reading these books and, you know, you get everything in the book like, you know, a half dozen times and, you know, you're like, yeah, I've, I have that now. Uh, I've gotten out of I got that in Cancun one time. <laughs> That's funny. Cooper likes that one. Yeah, <laughs> I'll leave that one up to you. You know, and it, I, of course I was like, oh, I got a clot, man. I'm about to die right now. It's, I'm throwing it right now. Here I go. I'm about to check out. And the only thing is that it didn't feel like pain. It didn't feel bad. Whatever it was, it was just there. And, I disregarded it. Okay, whatever. You know, I didn't know if it was, if it was anxiety, if it was fear, if it was God, if it was a meatball, whatever it was. It was something in there. I just let it go, and then boom, out into the, out into the storm we went. You know, and we're like, humping into the meat, the teeth of this storm, blowing. To the point where a few times, you know, you stop and you just kind of hold on a little bit and wait wait for it to pass, and then you move on a little bit. And there's 19 of us now with our Sherpas, you know, and I was passing each one of my buddies. I was feeling really strong, really strong that day, and I'd been a sissy leading up to that. I'd been one of the slowest people on the team, but that night something was happening, and I was feeling strong, and I was pushing, and I was passing each one of my buddies. You good? Yep, you good? Yep, you good? Until I'm all the way in the front of the whole group of 19, and to the point where I start peeling away, and I'm passing each I'm all the way, now I'm a half hour in front of everybody, now I'm an hour in front of everybody. And I was moving at what we call Himalayan turbo, man. I was like 
Step free, 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 step free, free. That's like fifth year, right? I was crushing. So I was flying and I was moving up and I'm an hour ahead. Now I'm two hours in front of everybody to the point where I can't even see them now. Like I can't even see their headlamps. They're just gone. And I realized at that very moment that I, I was higher than any person in the world and I was by myself by hours. And I was definitely intimidated a little bit. Um, and I was thinking, you know, if my mom could see this, she would be super pissed. But I was like, I was just way up, and I just was feeling it. And I was feeling where I was. I was feeling like there was a reason why I was there at that moment. And so I kept going, charging on. And it wasn't looking good. You know, the storm was still blowing around us. And my buddy Charlie Mace got on the radio. Charlie had just summoned K2 a couple of years before, and I heard Charlie say, um, He's like, man, I'm going to give it about a half hour, and, uh, you know, and I'm turning around if this weather doesn't get any better. And I heard Charlie say that. I was like, oh, boy, that's, that's rough. You've got to be really close, you know. And Anyway, I stood up, and I just kept going. And, and, and just when I thought it was getting to that point where we were going to have to turn around, by the time I got my, my camera out, this is what I got over in the horizon in Tibet as the sun was coming up. And I watched as the clouds dropped lower and lower and all that chaos and sort of violence that was around us slowed down and just went calm to the point where it was almost like eerily quiet. And I was still by myself up there. And I'd been, you know, I'd been going up this one slope and I, it's this kind of slope that that uh, you don't, you know, there's no mystery as to which way it went. It was right there. There was no other variations in the route. It just dropped off on both sides. And, but I, there was a rope that was going up right in front of me, right in front of this slope right here. And I'd been following that rope, not to necessarily know which way to go up, but to be able to know which way to go down. Because oftentimes that happens in big mountaineering. Is, you know, the, you get up to the top, the visibility shoots, the, she goes south on you. And everybody takes a real quick trip down to base camp real fast and gets disoriented. And so I knew that wasn't an option. So I needed to know the rope was there for the descent for my team. It had to be there. So that rope I'd been following, it all of a sudden stopped right in front of me. And I noticed that it did two things. And they both met up at the same place at the South Summit. Not the real summit, the South Summit. And they met up there. They did two different things. The team the night before, four people, had gone out to the left about 40 or 50 feet or so, and then up through about 150 feet of nasty rock, chossy, broken up, nasty shale sort of rock. The kind of stuff you take two steps up and one step back. The kind of stuff that I knew if I took Eric up that way, that it would waste him and he'd be out of gas because he just can't, he just slops his foot down and slides and hangs. It just, it just really depletes his energy significantly, very quickly. So that was option one. And then option two was right in front of me. It went up to the same place. It went on the same sort of slope, about 40, 50 degrees. Only problem was it was buried under about a foot to two foot of packed snow and ice, completely buried. So I knew if I had, was going to go that way, I'd have to dig the ropes out. So I could go the easy way for, for me and not dig any ropes out, but ultimately probably sacrifice Eric's summit, go that way, or... I could go the hard way for me, digging these ropes out at 28,000 feet at this point, but ensure that Eric can go up that same terrain where he goes just as fast as any of us and ensure the safe descent of the team. And I had that laid out in front of me. And I clearly remember kneeling down and just laughing, like, nice, man. Right here it is. This is cool. And I realized that was one of the most amazing, beautiful moments of my life was that very moment because it was all right there in front of me. Did I want to go the easy way for me or did I want to start digging it and putting it out there for the people around me? And, you know, there's like a million different definitions of leadership. You can go to Barnes & Noble and pick out one of a thousand books on how to be a great leader, and they're probably all right. I don't know. But I can tell you that leadership is not a business card or a placard on your desk or a 
how many people answered to you. It's none of those things. All it comes down to for me is seeking out opportunities and chances to show your team your level of commitment to whatever it is you're doing. That's it for me. Show the people around you how committed you are. You as leaders know what that means. You're fully committed. You're invested into this, what you're doing, and it becomes infectious and viral, and people just say, I want to be a part of this. And so I started digging, and I chopped, and I dug, and I chopped. For two hours, I dug at that stupid-ass rope. I would pull it and pull it up a little bit, and I'd pull a little bit more, and I'd chop, and I'd pull. And two hours later, I got up to the top of this thing, and I just kind of yanked it just a little bit more, and I remember it pulled like a banjo string, and I sat up, and I knelt down. <clears throat> and each one of my buddies came by, and we hugged, and then Eric got up to me, and, and uh, we were hugging, you know, and, and uh, he's like, thanks, you know, you've been throwing snowballs at me, you know, for the past two hours. I appreciate what you've been doing. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he's like, you ready to go? And I said, I don't think so, man. I'm, I'm smoked, done can't really go anymore, and uh, I'm out of gas. That thing in my chest was long gone, and so I was wasted, and I you know, was kneeling down, and, he, and, uh, he, and no kidding, if a blind dude could ever do the whole, like, boy, oh, 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 thing, he did it right then. He was like, what? You're not going to go? And I said, no, no, not, not going to do it, and uh, he told me later, a couple weeks later in Kathmandu, we were sitting in Kathmandu, and he goes, this is like, you know, at that moment when you said that to me, I was like, there's no way I could go. I was going to turn around with you. Because here, you know, was the biggest summit of all, and he knew that I had been digging those ropes out essentially for him. And we had stood on every single summit that that dude had ever stood on together. I'd been with him, arm in arm, and he had the biggest one of all, and I'd put it, I'd given it to him. And he knew that. And he goes, all right, so we're back there at that moment. He said, all right, so what are you going to do? And I said, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to go down, man. I'm going to get out of here and go down. And, and he goes, well, what do you think about me going? And I was like, dude, if you don't get going right now, I'm going to stick this boot so far up your, and then I, I finished what I was saying. And, and we hugged and we cried and our tears froze to our cheeks. And, and I watched as my best friend, who happened to be blind, stepped down off the South Summit and started to walk across to stand on top of the world. And I was not sad. I was not upset. I was happy and I was proud. And my heart was full. And it was a good thing. And so as I watched, as Eric walked across that ridge, I turned around and, and then at the same moment, I saw this. And what this is, is the summit of Ever or the, the, the sun coming up in Tibet behind us, casting a shadow of the summit of Mount Everest onto the valley floor of, of Nepal. And somehow the moon has just perched itself right over that shadow. And other than the birth of my little boy, that's straight up the craziest, most beautiful, nutty thing I'd ever seen in my life. And so I'm looking at this over to my left, and I'm watching my blind buddy over to my right, and I'm like, Jesus, man, what the hell is going on? It's just a little bit, a lot to process, and it's happening right here, right at this moment. And I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, maybe I should consider going for it here and just seeing what happens. Well, you had to think hard, because this is what I was looking at right here. This is where I was kneeling down right here on the south summit. This is the mountains laugh, last laugh at you, essentially. It's like, you know, basically seeing if you got the stones to be able to go across. Most of the people who get right here on Everest, they stand right there at that point, and then they're like, okay, thanks, I've had enough. And they turn around and go home because it's a little bit intimidating. You know, it's a 10,000-foot drop in the Tibet to the right and a 6,000-foot drop in the Nepal to the left. And either way, I was convinced that, you know, if I fell, it probably hurt pretty bad. So if... I decided if I was going to do it, man, I was going to come up with this mantra, you know, this like very simple mantra just to make it clean, make it precise, get, make it effective, whatever it is. So I just came up with this like, don't fall, don't fall. And I must have said don't fall 50,000 times walking across there, just dip, tiptoeing across. Got right behind Luis and then Eric and then me, and we walked across this ridge holding on and breathing. And 
and I'll take you there and show you what it's like. At the South Summit, you're at 28,700 feet. You're only 300 feet from the true summit. But you're still a couple hours away. Just waiting for Eric to get up there. They're 50 meters from the summit, over. People doubted you. You showed them. You showed them. We're only halfway there, guys. Good job, Nick. Thank you. Good job, buddy. You did it. You did it. So I think Eric would probably be the first person to tell you that the view's just a little bit overrated. You know, and but the, the the thing that really occurred to me was um, we only spent 20 minutes on top. It took us two months to get up there, and we spent 20 minutes on top. That was it. And the cool thing that I really realized in reflection of this whole process and what happened was that I didn't learn anything standing on top in that 20 minutes. I didn't learn anything about anything. But I learned it all sort of on that process and that whole cliche that it's all about the adventure and the journey, right? Well, isn't that the case, man? Because think about it. Life doesn't take place on the summits. You only have a few summits in your life, ultimately, right? Ultimately, academically, professionally, with the birth of children. It's just, those are your few precious summits. But life takes place otherwise on the side. That's where we fall down. That's where we get crushed. That's where we stand up and get after it again and again. So, you know, as you heard my other teammates say, um, when we were only halfway there, and isn't that the case with mountaineering, standing on top? I mean, you're only halfway. And think about it, I mean, every single year, you're only halfway. And then the next year, you're only halfway. And it just repeats this cycle. And it's a great analogy about being in the mountains. So, you know, we didn't really celebrate on top. We got back down. And that's where we really, truly started to be able to embrace what had happened. We, we, uh, we had a few, set a few records. We obviously got Eric up there, the first blind guy. But... Um, we also had a guy named Sherm Bull with us. He was 65 years old at the time. It was his first fifth try on Everest. He'd gotten close four times before. And if, if success would be the oldest guy at 65 to climb Everest. And he kept telling us, he's like, guys, I'm not trying to be the oldest man at Summit Mount Everest. I'm just, I'm just getting old trying, you know. And then, and then, uh, and then uh, the, the Kathmandu newspaper said, uh, you know, that, that Eric – Eric was, uh, or that Sherm was the oldest man. This is tr directly translated out of Nepalese into English. That that uh, Sherm was the oldest man to summit Mount Everest, and that Eric was the blindest man to summit Mount Everest. Which I guess is true. But then the record that we were the most proud of, and every all of us will tell you this, is that we had 19 guys summit from one team in one day. Previous record was nine, and I guarantee you that record will not fall. And you know why? is because everybody goes up to Everest now to turn in this crazy little circus where you pay $65,000 and go up and tag it, and then it's yours. And they're these weird, loose confederations of groups that aren't teams, and they go up there and they step over their dying person around them and then keep going because they paid their money and they got somewhere to be. And those aren't teams. Those are just these weird alliances of people that are going up there for their own self-vested interest. Nineteen people summited in one day. 
And I, I, I'm almost sure that that will never fall. So I leave you with this. You know, once again, remind you, it's not about climbing these, really climbing a mountain, right? It's, it's, it's so much deeper than that. We all love the mountains. It's one of the reasons why we're in this industry, why we're sitting in this room. We love mountains. And then think of them symbolically and the beauty that they represent, the challenges that they represent and how to be able to put yourself in positions where you can get up there and, and tackle it. Because sometimes those variables and those conditions are going to change just as they have this year. But what's, up, what's important to remember and embrace is this idea of aligning yourself with people that share that same vision that you do. Seek out opportunities to be a leader. Communicate effectively. Be a Sherpa. Get it done every day continue to fight the good fight. So I've really enjoyed hanging out with y'all. A bunch of really good people. I wish you the best of luck this year and ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Way to make Baldy look small out there, though, today. <laughs> Should have had your snow crew on. Let's see how that worked out. I, I did. Next time. But you took me, so yeah. I can tell you what I got. <laughs> Well, we're going to adjourn to dinner now, since we're running over a little bit today. Um, we're going to have cocktails over in the room where we were at last night. So thank you all for uh, coming out today, and look forward to a good evening. Uh